Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. This week's guest on our show is Diane Harwood. Uh, Diane is an expert on something that neither Gabe nor I had ever heard of before, which is postpartum bipolar disorder. Diane, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, you two. I'm honored to be here. Oh, we're honored to have you. Now, you are the author of Birth of a New Brain, Healing from Postpartum Bipolar Disorder. And we want to jump right in and ask, what is postpartum bipolar disorder? I know it sounds, to a lot of people, Gabe, it sounds very mysterious, but basically it is a form of bipolar disorder, and it's also considered something called, I'll I'll use the acronym first, a PMAD, and that stands for Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorder, so much easier to call it a PMAD. Uh, So it's one of seven different kinds of PMADs. I'll just throw out a couple other well-known PMADs, such as postpartum depression, that's one, and postpartum anxiety, that's another. Um, And it's bipolar disorder that's either triggered by pregnancy or by childbirth. So it is bipolar disorder. It's just the timing that is um, key as as, as to its definition. So how is it related to postpartum depression? Well, um, again, it's it's a PMAD. They're both PMADs, uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And it's actually postpartum depression is a component of postpartum bipolar disorder. Um, In other words, you do get the classic symptoms of depression. Uh, when you do have postpartum bipolar disorder. And then you also get the um, symptoms of mania, hypomania and mania as well. So that's different uh, from postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're just sort of, you know, they're both in the same class of mood disorders, basically. So how common is it? Because as I said a minute ago, we'd never heard of this before. Right, Granted, right. We're not, we're not women, as we've pointed out once or twice in the past, but <laughs> right. this, this does sound something like we should have been aware of it. Right. Well, it is, it is recognized in the incredibly long titled Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5. Um, it, it is there um, under the specifiers for bipolar disorder, uh, and they also they call it peripartum onset. And peripartum is just another way to say like postpartum, basically. There's hardly been any studies done on this, very, very small amount. But I, I've talked to uh, experts in the field, such as uh, Dr. Brenda Sharma is known as a world expert. He's a perinatal psychiatrist, and he threw out a rough estimate, maybe about 1% of every 1,000 births. One of the things that Vin and I learned, and we've, we've learned an awful lot on this show, and, and we pointed out the first time that we covered um, postpartum issues that not only are Vin and I both men, but we're also childless men. So we, we, have, uh, we have no personal experience with this. So when people talk about how common this is, we were surprised to learn that postpartum issues postpartum mental health issues were a lot more common than we thought. That's right. You have personal experience with this subject, right, Diane? That's right. I mean, I, I like to say I grew up with bipolar disorder at arm's length, literally with my father. I have a picture of him holding me when I was a baby. And um, I just, I, he had bipolar one disorder. So I saw it from, you know, basically when I was an infant, I was around this, this mental illness never in my wildest dreams thinking I would have it myself. Um, nobody, nobody, um, until I was about 37 years old, when I, when I was diagnosed with it, nobody thought, oh, you definitely seem like you have bipolar disorder or a tendency towards having it. So it really, even though I grew up with it, it just caught everybody by surprise. So how, how soon after you gave birth did it, did it hit? Was it right away? That's a good question. That's actually a, a big reason why I like to go out and tell people about this because none, no one thought I had a problem. And I, I knew something was wrong with me, but I didn't want to say anything. But basically right after I had my baby, I had um, postpartum hypomania where I had, you know, racing thoughts. I couldn't sleep. I was very um, elevated and talkative. Like I was talking twice as fast as I'm talking right now. So you can imagine. But no one really thought there was a problem. And so to answer your question, I didn't um, get diagnosed officially until six weeks after I gave birth. And I voluntarily brought myself down to the hospital to do that, Mm. to the psych unit. Um, Because by that point, it was obvious. None of us could hide the fact there was a problem. I also had a really strange symptom, which 
I hope it's okay. I'd love to tell people about it. Please. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's actually, it's really interesting. And Gabe, I know, well, actually, you're both writers, both of you, published writers. So I had this really weird symptom called hypergraphia. And usually it happens a lot with people with temporal lobe epilepsy, but I've heard from a lot of people with bipolar disorder. And you're probably wondering, what is it? Well, it's basically nonstop compulsive writing. You can't stop writing. And you write on strange objects, including your body sometimes, or mirrors, or where, wherever, wherever. And when I got home from the hospital, I started writing all the time. Like, I couldn't stop. It's like the opposite of writer's block, basically. But it's not happy. <laughs> it's not a good feeling, because right. physically, you can't keep doing that for long. I started having carpal tunnel, and it, it, I knew something was wrong, you know? Wow. So, what kind of things were you writing, yeah. just out of curiosity? Well, the funny thing is that such that no one's ever asked me that. It's such an awesome question. One of the hallmark traits of hypergraphia is that when you look at it later on, you can't even read it. It's like totally crazy, like legible scrawls and stuff. Uh, I I don't remember, and I, I when I tried to look at some of the writing, I couldn't make head or tails of it. So I don't know. That's not that's not true for every single person. Some people can write, and you can make sense of it. But but it is way more common that you can't you can't tell what it is. So. What's, uh, what's very interesting about it is it's almost like written racing thoughts. You know, in bipolar disorder, when exactly. somebody has racing thoughts, it's, it's, it's just word salad. It's a, it's a jumbled mess of, of almost nothing. Uh, it's just because they're words and because people are gesturing and speaking, they think they're saying something and it's very scary to the people around them. Uh, when you're writing yeah. nonsense, people are just like, oh, you're sitting in a corner writing. It's, it's, it's only scary if you read it. Uh, no, it's, 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 that's a really uh, cool way, and that's exactly what it was, Gabe. And so, you know, I've read people who read other people's experiences of it, and they some people enjoyed it. They enjoyed their experience, but for me, it was just it was just not a good thing. And I was also, I mean, most importantly, I had a baby, a newborn, and a toddler right in front of me. It's like I wasn't paying attention to my children. I was just in this frantic rush to get out every thought on paper. So it was it was not good. Did you uh, did you write on the baby? I did not write on the baby. Okay, good. <laughs> at least at least I and that you know if you don't mind me jumping in with another topic, believe me, it's related. I a big big um, point of confusion with postpartum bipolar disorder is that it is connected with postpartum psychosis sometimes, but not always. And had I done something like that, if I started writing my baby, then I probably would have been across the threshold, and that would have been postpartum psychosis. Mm -hmm. I knew I. Was, you're you're close. You're close to there, you know, in certain cases. But I didn't quite cross the bridge into that, thank God, uh, because that's the worst of the worst. Of course, of course. As somebody who lives with bipolar disorder, uh, I, I know how these things can present and, and how they look. And uh, I don't have any children. So when when these symptoms were coming out, some people thought that they were maybe interesting or fun. Uh, other people thought mm -hmm. that maybe I was uh, a jerk or uh, just unreliable. Um, but everybody thought something, you know, that magical word, that right. something was going on, but they didn't know what. Now, the situation of somebody who's experiencing postpartum bipolar disorder is actually probably a little more dire because something is going on to a child's mother. And that means that mm -hmm. you are not 100% available for your newborn child. So how did that factor into yeah. the way you reacted and the way the people around you reacted? Oh, God. Well, I was just, I was in another state. I, I, was, I felt like I was in a wipeout, you know, going big boogie boarding or surfing but at Mavericks. I don't know if you two have heard of Mavericks, but that's where they have the 100-foot waves. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know if this really answers your question, but, um, but now I look back on it and I'm very sad about it. I was just watching videos today with my, my mom who's in town of my daughter when she was a baby, my first child. Uh, this happened with my second child, the postpartum bipolar disorder. And we don't have any videos taken of my second child because things were so frenetic. We can't, we can't find anything. And it, it just, it just little things like that, you know, that I, I, I don't know, it just makes me really sad that I wasn't there to soak everything in. And as far as, you know, how it's affecting my, my girls, my girls seem really good and they're, they're emotionally stable and they, they know what bipolar disorder is. 
Um, but the whole thing is just bittersweet. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but I'm trying. <laughs> no, no you're, you're answering the question fantastic <laughs> because essentially what you're saying is that everything turned out okay because you got treatment, which of course begs the question, right. what is the treatment for postpartum bipolar disorder? Right. Well, again, it's, it's really similar to, to bipolar, standard bipolar disorder treatment, medication, therapy, finding a good psychiatrist who can help you. For me, those were what helped me out of it. I, I didn't have ECT until um, much, much later when I started having depression. Because again, I, my postpartum bipolar manifested as mania. And the depression didn't come until months later, a few months later. Um, so I had ECT after I had a really awful thing happen and with my father dying. Um, so it's more like a situational thing. But it did, ECT totally helped me. And it, it is being used a lot with uh, women who are pregnant uh, with success from the studies that I read. Um, there's also now, now this happened to me 11 years ago, and I know you both know this, there's newer treatments available that I could try or anyone could try, like um, I hear a lot about ketamine, uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, things like that. But I didn't, you know, I just, I did whatever I could, whatever was available to me when 11 years ago, uh, that's biggie with medication. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. Now you were hospitalized more than once, right? That's right. That's right. Could you tell us a little bit about the experiences that you had in the hospital and, you know, what, what treatments you got there that were maybe, you know, not the standard pills and whatnot? Sure. I mean, that, the hospitalization, first of all, I, I it saved my life. I would like to give it credit. Uh, again, this was 11 years ago when, uh, and I stayed at hospitals that weren't exactly luxury hospitals. So. <laughs> To describe it as that, but uh, basically, I went to the hospital. You know, when I had the mania the first time, and then the subsequent times were for depression. So, so mania the first time, and then the six other times for depression. And I was, I just saw a psychiatrist, and the main thing was just being in a safe environment, a controlled environment where uh, we tried different medications um, to see if any of them would help. But unfortunately, I was treatment resistant, which is why I had so many hospitalizations, as you can probably infer. Of course, yeah. Uh, it took over 25 medica medication trials to, until I found the right one. I didn't go through 25 med changes, but I went through many med changes personally. And I was just fighting for my own life. But I, I imagine that, one, you personally wanted to be well, but was there a component that you also wanted to be well for your children? Or is that just the stuff of movies where everybody, every woman is fighting for their kids? How did how did being a mom play into that? Well, I, of course, you know, I definitely wanted to get better for my girls. But I'll be honest, I mean, I was... You know, Gabe, like when you are at the depths, in the depths of despair and you're numb and detached from everything, I wasn't really thinking of them that much because I just was mired. You know, I was stuck in that horrible hole. They came and visited me. And when, when I would see them in person, my heart would melt. It, it, I did saw um, and, and, and it would be a, it would kind of wake me up a little bit. But they couldn't come that much. I won't go into the reasons why because they're boring. But it was, you know, logistical <laughs> stuff. Sure. I was 45 minutes away. And my husband was basically thrown into being a single father and trying to keep his job, you know. So I didn't, like, if I had been in the same town, I could have seen them more often. But, but yeah, that's how, that, and that's why this is such a horrible illness and why I hope women get treated for it sooner and, and don't go through what I went through. Because no mom should be, you know, separated and just feeling detached from her children the way that I did. So. I'm not going to do a do-over. I'm 48 years old, so I ain't having any more children. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. <laughs> I'm doing it over with my dog. Awesome. Now, you mentioned uh, your husband had to become like a single father there for a little while. How else did your your illness affect him and, and continues to in that, in that respect? Well, again, since you're both writers, I can't resist telling you something that actually really did help him. Um, it's just deal with this because this went on for so many years and he, he had a hobby 
I called it the other woman, but I always said that in a joking way, but he was working on his own book that whole time, which was a labor of love and really kind of brought, gave him a break from all this horrible stuff going on, you know? So, so that was cool. I know, I know not every father can do that in that situation. So to be honest, you guys, I mean, we didn't have hardly any support up here. That was a big part of our problem is we didn't have hardly any friends. Um, no one knew what was going on and our community didn't, you know how nowadays people will kind of rally together Mm -hmm. like through Facebook or, or whatever, GoFundMe or whatever. We were kind of in our own little vacuum. So, so that was, that really behooved us. Where did you live at the time? Uh, It's the same place where we live now. It's called Ben Lomond up in Santa Cruz County where they filmed the Lost Boys. Right. Very famous movie. (laughs) California, right? Yeah. Did I get one right? You got you got it right, Gabe. Yeah, Gabe. <laughs> yeah, I, I, very good. Very I, good. I, I know where like four places are on Earth, and that was one of them. I, I like to say I have spatial dysplasia, which is a, a common uh, side effect or si- symptom of of bipolar disorder. I have no idea if that's true or if I just really suck at directions. But the DSM five <laughs> categorizes everything as a mental illness now, so it's really helpful. That's right. It does. It does. <laughs> There's obviously a lot of questions that we can ask about postpartum bipolar disorder, and I know that you would be happy to answer them. But one of the biggest ones that I want to ask is, how is your family now? You know, here it is, like you said, 11 years later, you had seven hospitalizations, you had ECT, your husband went through all of this, you were isolated in a vacuum. I mean, you and your family really went through a lot. How did you come out on the other side? How is life today in 2018? Well, life is really good. It's still incredibly stressful. I had to deal with a temper tantrum right before uh, this podcast, in fact. <laughs> so it's not all, what is it, wine and roses. But um, Was it was it your kids or the husband? No, both of them, actually. <laughs> the best behaved member of this family is our dog, Lucy. But that's another podcast topic. <laughs> but um, things, things are good. We, I don't think I mentioned before, I mean, my husband, Craig, when, when things were really bad, he did go see a therapist for a few sessions and we also had some family therapy uh, that definitely helped us and and you know it almost destroyed our marriage it, I, I didn't do I mean I'm grateful I didn't have like the classic symptom of hypersexuality where I went out and you know we know, you know what that means everybody but um you know but it, it, it will test any marriage whether or not you have children but uh but everyone's stable I, I know that word kind of has different meanings for each person but to me I like the word stable I like because it means I'm out of the hospital and things are just moving along and we're just all doing the best that we can. So knock on wood. It, it was always fascinating <laughs> to me as, as you know, somebody that lives so long with untreated bipolar disorder and all of the things that that brings from, you know, mania, hypersexuality and everything else that here I am. And what I consider success is that I am an incredibly boring guy. I, I go to bed <laughs> at nine 30. I, I just, 20 year old Gabe would just just be so disgusted at 40 year old Gabe <laughs> but I gotta tell you it as you know boring is stable and and stable allows you to make long lasting connections and uh, and achieve and accomplish and it could mean that you have a pony too and it could mean that you have, have a pony, pony. <laughs> Vin do you have a pony <laughs> No, just, no, no, I know. I don't have a stable well, that's either. That's what he says. <laughs> so we, we now know that you're stable and we know that life is good. And, and we, we've all agreed that, that boring is fantastic. But, you know, just in a few words, I mean, without falling down the rabbit hole, what are some things that you use to stay stable now? Um, I'll make it simple. Believe me, simple is, I like simple. I actually call them linchpins without even knowing what a linchpin was until I, I Googled it. You guys know what linchpins are, Sure, right? of course. So I have a few, and they're all, they're all boring, but they're what we all hear in the bipolar community. They're, you know, doing exercise, making sure I get enough sleep, which that is a, a challenge. Having children always makes that even more of a challenge. So exercise, sleep, um, I like to go out in nature, la, la, la. forest bathing, that's the trendy term for it, but I love that. And then I know this is going to sound a little bit uh, unicorny, rainbowish, but having my dog, I've had her for four years, and she's not technically an emotional support animal, but she might as well be. She, she's brought a lot of joy into my life, and she's also helped me get that exercise. Where I mean, I'm not going out and r- running 10Ks anymore like I, I used to a long time ago, but she... She, she's actually overweight, and I do have to take her out almost every day for 20 minutes. 
So they kind of go hand in hand in keeping me consistent. And then, you know, I take my medication. That's essential. I take that. And, and this is, I used to be an anti-medication person. I, I've described that in my book, so I won't go into it. But I am a major, major believer in medication now. That's all I'm going to say. Wonderful. <laughs> the, uh, I, I feel that it's almost a rite of passage with most people with bipolar disorder that, that we reject the medication. Um, I'm actually considered weird yeah. because I never did. But sincerely, yeah. the reason that I didn't is because somebody got a hold of me literally the same day I was diagnosed and warned me about it. And that's why I'm such an advocate right. of education and letting people in our community know what we're going to run into. Because as you describe in your book, the mistakes can be costly. And oh, yeah. we're so happy that you came through on the other side. So while we're talking about the book, where can we find it? What's your website? And I'm going to assume that you're going to say Amazon.com. You are right. <laughs> just Amazon is fine for now. My website is in construction, so we can we can just stick with Amazon and keep it, keep it simple. Excellent. <laughs> Diane, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask if you had... Any last words, words of wisdom for any mothers living with postpartum bipolar disorder or any of the other PMADs? I do, and, and this actually applies to everybody, not just women, but men as well. And I would just like to say, I, I know it's a cliche, because I always thought it was a cliche myself, but please don't give up no matter what. I mean, there's, there's definitely hope, even when everything seems hopeless, it's there. So just try your best to reach out to people to help you and to find a, a good professional who can help you try different things. Because even if the first few things don't work, you will eventually find something that does. So treat it like a job to find the right, the right medication that will help you rise out of that hole. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for agreeing to be on the show. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere. All you have to do is go over to betterhelp.com slash psych central. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Psych Central Show. Please rate, review and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at GabeHoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counselor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at VincentMWales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email TalkBack at PsychCentral.com.